Today I'd like to uh, uh, drop down a, a level from um, Dr. Wood's uh, presentation uh, and talk about a specific project that um, Manitoba Hydro and some of its um, customers in uh, Minnesota are working on that involves the construction of a new major transmission line uh, between Canada and the United States. Um, much like the great state of, uh, of Washington um, and the resources, the hydro resources of the Columbia River, Manitoba has been blessed with uh, huge hydroelectric resources on the Nelson River. Um, the Columbia River is almost 100% developed. The Nelson River is less than 50% developed. And we're still engaged in the um, large scale um, development of that uh, potential. Um, Manitoba has been involved in uh, international trade of electricity um, since the early 1960s with the first uh, construction of an interconnection between um, Manitoba and North Dakota. And um, we now are currently interconnected uh, south into North Dakota and into Minnesota with over 2,000 megawatts of transfer capability. Um, that means in an average year we're able to supply about 10% of the needs of, uh, of, of the state of Minnesota, the electrical needs. And um, the load in Manitoba is growing. We're continuing to develop our, our projects. And um, new transmission between Canada and the United States is critical to the development of those projects. In the, in the, in the old days, building uh, transmission lines was not easy. Um, building transmission lines across international borders has never been easy but it's getting more difficult um, as time goes by. It's not just the relationship between Manitoba Hydro and its um, contracting uh, party in the United States, whether that's Northern States Power, Minnesota Power, Minkota Power. It's now become a regional issue. Um, it's complicated because uh, FERC is, um, um, has uh, issued some orders on uh, uh, transmission funding. It's complicated because of the issue of renewable portfolio standards and the needs of states to meet their loads uh, from renewable resources. Um, we now have markets. There's the Midwest Independent System Operator who is operating a, a large scale market in um, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and, um, and, and the states to the east, and Manitoba is, is part of that market. So it's not easy building transmission today uh, much more difficult than it was in the past. Just a bit about uh, the, the company that I work for, Manitoba Hydro. It's a public power company owned by the province. We have about $2 billion in annual revenues, about $13 billion in assets, mostly in large hydroelectric uh, generating stations. 5,500 megawatts of generating capacity. The vast majority of that is in large hydro plants. In, an, in, an, in a normal year, 98% of our production is from the hydro resource. In the wintertime, our peak demand occurs. Unlike most U.S. states where it's a summer-driven peak demand, that creates opportunity for Manitoba Hydro to sell its surplus in the summer and to buy back power in the wintertime when our, our demands meet. So there's lots of synergies north-south. And we're growing. We're growing about 80 megawatts a year, and in the, in the context of our utility, that's one large hydro generator a year we need to add to the system. And we're a member of the MISO market. I um, put the little star on there to show the location of Winnipeg. Anybody who uh, is interested in hockey, join me in uh, talking about our, our new hockey team. And uh, those of you who are from Grand Forks and, uh, and from, uh, and from uh, Fargo and, 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 and south of Manitoba, come on up. We've got a great team. Looking forward to uh, hosting you. Our hydro potential um, is illustrated in this slide. These are very large dams. The drop of the water at these locations is about 100 feet. Average flow in this river is about 112,000 cubic feet per second. These dams are about a mile wide. Um, and most of these dams um, are within 200 miles of Hudson Bay. So. Canadian prairies and they drop down about 700 feet to the sea and it's in this last uh, cascading reach of the Nelson River that development is occurring. We've developed half the resource, there's still half to go. Most of these projects are run in the river. These projects um, 
are within the river, there's very minor flooding associated with the development of this potential. And clean and renewable power is the result of this uh, development. Hydro characteristics, there are long lead times for these projects. It takes forever to build. A young engineer at Manitoba Hydro comes along, he may be lucky in his career to see the construction of one of these. And, and they take eight years to build, nine years to build, but it's the regulatory process, our, our dealing with our uh, relationships with the Aboriginal communities in the north, bringing them on as partners. These take a lot of times. And the, and the project that we're working on right now at the Kiosk Generating Station, we been working on that for about 500, not 500, for five years. We've spent about $400 million on that project and we've yet to put any steel or concrete in the ground. It's a huge investment, $5.5 billion. And um, most, almost half the time to develop these is, is in project planning, engineering, uh, environmental reviews. And um, as a result, they have a very high initial capital cost, but they do result in a very low operating cost production cost, the actual incremental cost of producing a kilowatt hour of elect or a kilowatt hour of electricity or megawatt hour is about about uh, 25 cents, so it's very, very low. They have very long lives. The ones we have that we built 100 years ago are still going. There's no reason why they'll ever uh, not uh, produce electricity. They do bring a lot of surplus energy to the market, above and beyond what Manitoba Hydro needs to serve its own customers. There are zero emissions associated with these projects. And, and, and much like most other renewable resources, whether it's wind or it's hydro, they're built in remote locations and they need long transmission lines to get the electricity from where it's generated to the marketplace. It's a map, Manitoba, Winnipeg down in the, uh, at the bottom of the slide. Most Canadians live within 100 miles of the border. It's too, too cold to go much farther north. <laughs> And, uh, and, and, and most of Manitoba's hydro potential is within, um, um, like I said, 150 miles of the Hudson Bay. And you can see those three small dots at the, uh, at the um, upper right-hand corner of the, of, of the map. There's 3,600 megawatts of developed hydro at that location. I mentioned the, the, the challenge of bringing um, remote renewables to market. We've connected our northern hydro to southern Manitoba with a 600-mile long high voltage direct current transmission line. We're planning on building another 2,200 megawatts of new hydro in the next uh, 15 years. That will require the construction of another 900 miles of new transmission to bring that to Winnipeg. This is the fuel supply for a, for a hydro uh, station. This is a history of a bar chart showing the history of water flows going back 100 years to about 1912. And you can see there's periods of low flows in the 30s and there, in, in 1940 was our lowest flow on record. Periods of high flows like the great flood of 1997 caused the flooding of Grand Forks. All that water flows north into, uh, into Manitoba. And this year again, um, record flooding because of the high water flows in, 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 in the upper Midwest, resulting in, in record high flows. It doesn't show on this chart, higher than uh, ever recorded in the past. But that's the water supply, that's the fuel supply for a hydroelectric system. The lowest flow on record be creates what we call the firm energy supply. That's the minimum amount of power that you can count on from that, and that's the power that we use to serve our firm load obligations. Customers in Manitoba, our customers in Minnesota, that's where they get their supply from. What that means is that in almost all other years, there's surplus energy that's available for, for sale. And that surplus energy needs to get to market, and it needs transmission lines to do that. This is a map showing the North American electric grid. Doesn't uh, go down into Mexico, uh, unfortunately. But what I want to point out in this uh, chart is where are the major interconnections between Canada and the United States? Um, strongly interconnected out here on the west coast between BC and Washington. Why is that? BC Hydro is like Manitoba Hydro. They've developed their hydro resources, they have large surpluses, lots of electricity gets traded north-south. So you need to have strong interconnections. If you look out in the east between Quebec and uh, New York, very strong interconnections. Why? Large markets, you need to have strong interconnections in order the surplus that Quebec produces can get to market. If you look at 
in contrast, if you look at locations like Saskatchewan, Alberta, um, they don't have surplus energy. They generate their electricity like most utilities with coal, natural gas. They don't have a, uh, they don't have a surplus they need to get to market. So they're w weakly interconnected. And then you have Manitoba in the center, strong interconnection, over 2,000 megawatts of transfer capability connecting north-south. Why doesn't Canada connect east-west? The Canadian market is too small to absorb the large surpluses that the hydro utilities in Canada produce. The market for the surplus has to go south because that's where the, that's where the demand is and um, not, there's enough capability to absorb the surplus that's produced by these hydro utilities. So what we're looking now in, uh, with the development of our additional 2,000 megawatts of northern hydro is to uh, strengthen this interconnection between Manitoba and um, actually inter interconnecting into North Dakota and then using that interconnection from North Dakota into, into Minnesota. Our um, relationships have always been uh, dependent upon um, partners sharing um, in the benefits of the hydro development. Um, Manitoba Hydro's interest in is that new hydro plants come in large blocks. New hydro plant is 1,000 megawatts. Our load's growing at 80 megawatts a year. There's lots of surplus power that's produced early on. So we, need, we enter into these long-term contracts to sell off that surplus so that we can minimize our early generation investment risk. Transmission is needed to get that energy to market, and long lines are needed to reach the U.S. load centers. Unfortunately, most of that transmission is not in Manitoba. Manitoba Hydro can take care of getting the power to the border, but there's no load at the border. There's, you know, when you go, when you drive down Highway 75 between Winnipeg and you get to, get to the border at Pemina, it's a few homes, maybe a few kilowatts of load, but there's, not a, there's no load center there. The loads have, the, the power has to go south, it has to get down into Grand Forks, it has to get to Fargo, it has to get to Minneapolis. And so that challenge is there's 50 miles of line to the border, there's another 500 miles of line that needs to be built. And from Manitoba Hydro's perspective, in another country, in another state, and it's not something that it can control, it needs partners who find that the benefits of those projects um, justify their involvement. New transmission is expensive, very difficult to permit, and not built on spec, especially f when a company is outside of uh, the United States and it's trying to achieve its, bin uh, achieve its business goals in, a, in another country. For that reason, our partnerships with large U.S. companies like XL Energy, Minnesota Power, Wisconsin Public Service, Great River Energy, all the major generators in, in Minnesota and Wisconsin is, is critical to our success. Renewable, renewable options. Wind will be the major technology that the country will use to meet its renewable goals in the future. MISO has, the Midwest Independent System Operator, has over 60,000 megawatts of requests for transmission service in the queue at, at, at this moment, looking for transmission service to get to market. Most of that generation, wind generation, is in the great um, resource area of North Dakota, that strong wind regime. Those Utilities up there need, need market outlet. Manitoba Hydro's 5,000 megawatts is not going to meet the renewable objectives of the United States. It's too small. But new hydro can help. Hydro can help because it has dispatchable capacity. You can turn the generators on and off um, when needed. And you can use the reservoirs to store the energy. Hydro improves grid operability because it provides additional ancillary services. It can provide regulation services. And there's a lot of technical services, but it's, 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 it's more than just uh, the energy that comes off a wind generator that, that, that only generates when the wind blows. And the big benefit is it has large-scale storage. The reservoirs can act as a battery, soaking up the en excess energy that's generated when the wind blows at night and there's no load. Where does that energy go? Well, Manitoba Hydro can stop generating, can store the water, allow the wind energy to go to market, and then when the wind isn't blowing, hydro can turn its generators back on and, in effect, act as a rechargeable battery for the grid. And large hydro uh, uh, can be renewable. It is renewable, but some people view that large hydro isn't renewable because it, they feel that size is an issue. Um, 
there are large hydro projects that uh, are bad. There's large hydro projects that are good. Large hydro projects have, can have less impacts than small hydro projects. It's a project-dependent issue, not one that needs to be um, uh, dismissed uh, just because of size. So when you develop this transmission, the question is, do you build private lines that just meet the capacity requirements of the contract, or do you engage in a, a regional transmission study so that the new interconnection that's built is optimized so that the value of all the renewable resources can be maximized. And that's what our objective is in this new line. This is a chart that shows how we can cycle our hydro up and down on a daily basis to meet the market demands, just showing um, the flexibility. This is just a chart showing how little uh, wind and hydro emit relative to the other uh, carbon-based um, generation sources. Um, hydro can be a part of the solution. Our new projects will provide the equivalent of about 10 million tons of carbon equivalent displacement. If you compare that to the emissions from Minnesota, about 36 million metric tons a year, um, you can see that the scale of these projects is significant when we're looking at um, reducing the amount of carbon emitted. We've engaged with, with Minnesota Power and Wisconsin Public Service in these two large, uh, with two large power sales. These power sales will need new transmission. The question is, what transmission do you build now? Do you build a, a direct line between Manitoba and Wisconsin? Or do you engage with the U.S. utilities in Minnesota and North Dakota and find a, a solution that solves the regional transmission problem? And I, both these contracts are subject to finding that solution. These are the transmission projects that are being proposed right now by the Minnesota utilities to deal with reliability issues and to enable wind energy that's being generated in the Buffalo Ridge region in, in South Dakota and in western Minnesota and interconnection, interconnecting into um, Fargo into the Twin Cities. These projects are uh, permitted, they're underway. Uh, if you drive down I the Interstate 94, you'll see the 345 Kiwi lines that are being built today. Our project is two phases. Phase one, building a new 500 kV line from Winnipeg into Fargo. And what that project will do is it'll allow the export of 1,100 megawatts from Manitoba into, into Fargo and into, into Minneapolis. But that transmission line will enable an additional 1,000 megawatts of wind to be generated in North Dakota and fed into the grid at Fargo. Phase two involves an additional 500 kV line from Fargo south into um, South Dakota down in the Buffalo Ridge region down to Split Rock. And it doesn't really change the, the export capability from Canada at all, still 1,100 megawatts. But what it does is it enables 4,300 megawatts of new wind generation to be injected into the grid at Fargo and in the Buffalo Ridge region. So you can see how the combination of working together on a regional solution, although this transmission line doesn't go anywhere near Minnesota Power Service territory, it doesn't go anywhere near Wisconsin, enables the flow of power through the existing grid to be enhanced. And that's what we're all about, trying to find a solution to this problem that meets our business needs as well as the needs of the region as a whole, the needs of North Dakota to find transmission outlet for their renewable resources and um, assist our customers uh, uh, out, out in, in Wisconsin. So what's, what am I asking from you? What we need is recognition. We need recognition that, um, that new large hydro is renewable, that when, when state and federal standards are being developed, people think renewable is wind. I'm asking you to think beyond wind. Think that hydro is renewable as well. And when, when, when we bring forward a project that that, that, that's looking to take advantage of the new FERC 1000 order um, that, that renewable can be considered to include hydro. That wind and hydro are perfect partners. The combination of the two, the wind and the hydro, can work together for the benefit of both. They're not competing with each other. There's no way that Manitoba Hydro's surplus can compete with the wind resources of North Dakota. But together we can build a regional transmission system that will be developed to maximize the benefit of both. And that as you develop regional transmission planning and funding policies, forget about the border. We're, one, we're interconnected north-south. We always have been. The electrons don't do anything different when they cross the border. And that we, as we develop the transmission grid, that, that we should kind of set the border aside and do what's right, and um, we'll all benefit. Thank you. <laughs>